Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming out this morning and honoring these heroes behind us and the 13 that just passed away on April 26, 2021. 20 years ago, the sun was shining and it seemed like just like an ordinary day, just like today, actually. I remember that morning quite well. My daughter Taylor was just a few weeks old and the only thing I could, whew, way too early for this. The only thing I could think of is what did I do? I had this beautiful baby girl and our country was under attack. My brother Steven was home on leave from Germany where he was currently stationed and staying at my house. My name is Kendra Lynn and my brother Staff Sergeant Steven Tudor was killed in action in Baghdad, Iraq on April 1st, 2007. At this time, we're gonna pause for 93 seconds because at 10.03, flight 93 went down in Shanksville. So please pause for a 93 second moment of silence. Thank you. We're gonna to begin today with invocation by Dennis D'Augustine from the Scranton Fire Department, followed by the national anthem being sung by R.J. Scowen. I'm wearing my uh, fire chaplain uniform in loving honor and memory of chaplain father, Michael Fallon Judge who was chaplain to the New York City Fire Department and the first official victim of 9-11 attacks. Let us pray to uh, our great God. God, creator of all people and all nations, it is with great sorrow that we remember the tragic events that occurred on this day. Even though the events of 9-11 took place long ago, Many of us can still recall exactly where we were at and remember them like it was yesterday. Today, Lord, we remember all those who lost their lives. We lift to you those who died in the Twin Towers, at the Pentagon, on United Airlines Flight 93. We seek to honor the memory of nearly 3,000 individuals who died on September 11th, 2001, we entrust them to your loving care. For their families, friends, and all who mourn their loss, we pray for strength, peace, and comfort. We also remember and honor our heroes who stepped in to help, to save, to serve. We will never forget the 412 emergency workers who gave their lives 
for the noble cause of rescuing others. This included 343 firefighters and their chaplains and many others due to cancer-related illness. I also think of my brother, Officer Daniel, Daniel Schauffler, who volunteered after the September 11th attacks in New York City as a first responder. End of watch, January 22nd, 2019. We entrust them to your love and care. Lord, today we also remember the over 7,000 U.S. service members who have died in the post-9-11 war zones of Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and elsewhere. We also think of the over 31,000 who have been injured. We entrust them to your loving care. We also pray for the spirit of unity to revisit our nation, the unity we felt in the midst of our struggles and our confusion. We pray that you, we would look to you, God, for wisdom, focus, and guidance just as many did during that time of uncertainty. Let us resolve that in the face of hatred, we will show love, that in times of despair, we will be voices of hope, that in times of darkness, we will be sources of life. Let us resolve that we will never regard forgiveness as weakness, but rather as a source of strength in our lives and in our world. As foundations we once thought secure have been shaken, we are reminded of the illusion of security. In commemorating this tragedy, we give you thanks for your presence in our time of need. We come remembering and we come in hope, not in ourselves, but in you, God. And most of all, Lord, we pray for your return and know that one day you will put an end to every single tragedy and you will wipe away all of our tears. This is our hope, the hope of heaven. We love you, and we pray all these things in your powerful name. Amen. 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 We have not forgotten. Post 25, American Legion, post 665, post color. R.J. Scooton. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the peril Fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rockets red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still.
You may be seated. Thank you, RJ. That was beautiful. We gather today in memory of those who have fallen while protecting our great land and those that perished that September day. We gather as witnesses when the words like courage and sacrifice no longer are abstract ideals, but instead hardened realities that leave a lifetime loss on families and a permanent mark on our country. We gather to honor the fallen and to publicly acknowledge their last full measure of devotion. There are over 5,000 faces behind me with 5,000 stories. Mine is just one of those stories. My story isn't more important. It isn't a greater loss than the others, but it also isn't any less. Since September 11, 2001, we have lost 7,051 men and women, including the 13 that just passed in Afghanistan to my right. They gave their life for me, they gave their life for you, and countless others who will never know them. They are our heroes. They are our friends, our siblings, our children. They were moms, dads, sisters, brothers, nephews, aunts, uncles. These men and women will never get the chance to experience the cycle of life, the birth and growth of their children, they shall not grow old because they chose to stand in our place and face the enemy for us. Let me say that again. They chose. Amen. It isn't enough to acknowledge the fallen by name or just inscribe their names in marble as proof that they lived and died. To truly honor the fallen, we must acknowledge how and why they gave their lives. Their death was not a random act or a splash of misfortune. These men and women voluntarily put themselves in harm's way, prepared to die so that we may rest secured here at home. They are the insurance policy that, that guarantees that our founding documents, our God-given rights, are more worthy than their own tomorrows. Now this is my story. I'm a middle child of seven kids, three boys and four girls. We were quite poor growing up. We moved a lot, 36 times to be exact, before I was in the ninth grade. NEPA was always our home. Growing up, all we had was each other because we moved around so much it was hard to make friends. So our siblings were our best friends. I tell you this because when you do not have a lot of direction growing up, you tend to want more for yourself. Stephen, being the oldest of the boys, wanted a purpose in life. He wanted more than what we were offered as children. So we were living in Dunmore at the time, and he was about two months from graduating, class of 1989, and decided to list in the United States Army. If you remember, that was the beginning of our first conflicts with Iraq. So a year and a half uh, so a year after he enlisted, he was sent over to Kuwait to serve in Operation Desert Storm. My other two brothers, Juan and Mario, were lost without him. It's always been the three boys. Stephen served a year overseas in Operation Desert Storm, came home on leaves to visit wherever we were living at that point. Juan and Mario looked up to him and saw that the military was giving Stephen a purpose, a career, and a hopeful future. So upon their graduation days, they both enlisted in the U.S. Marines. It was quite great when they were all three in the service. They were always making jokes on each other. You know, Marines are always better, Army, you know. Um, yeah. <laughs> My brother Mario met his wife as she was in the Navy at the time. Stephen also met his wife, Wanda, in the Army. She also was currently enlisted. My sister Kalani also married a Marine Corey and he just retired after 21 years of service. So military life was all around me, life was good. My immediate family, my three brothers, my two sister-in-laws and one brother-in-law has 72 years of service in the military. My brothers, 
I'm sorry. When I was adding these numbers up the other day, I couldn't believe it. 72 years. That's almost double my age. I, it, I just could not believe it. I'm so proud of them. So we fast forward to 2001. September 11th. As I said, Stephen was home on leave from Germany, staying at my house in Tunkhannock. My daughter Taylor was just a couple weeks old. I ran out. I would only be gone for a half hour. We had plans to go visit planes in Scranton. I turned on the radio just as the second plane hit. I immediately called Stephen and told him I didn't think we were going anywhere. He had no idea. I told him to turn on the TV. It got really quiet. He knew what was happening. The next couple days were really tough. I had to get him back to the airport with all the craziness. Picking him up from the airport was so different than dropping him off. We all know how scary the days, weeks, months were, were after 9-11. Stephen rema remained in Germany for a year, then went back to Fort Drum with his wife and two kids. A year later, Stephen got his orders to be deployed to Iraq. He, would to he was told he'd only be there for a year, but we all know how that goes. We had just lost our sister to a drug overdose, and I was thinking statistically he would totally be fine because my sister just passed away. There's no, go no way God would take both of them, so I did not really worry much. My sister dying was the most awful thing I had to go through, and no way could I go through that again. Stephen served his year, came home to Fort Drum for about a year and a half, and then was told he was going back. So close to retirement, he had already served 18 years, so we had to just get the, through this last deployment. He wanted to come home and be with his kids and travel. Honestly, the next couple weeks, months, and even years are such a blur. Eventually, I started finally coming back from that faraway place, and trust me, it was far, so bad my brothers wanted to commit me. Um, I wanted people, everyday people, to recognize what our military men and women sacrifice every day for our freedom. Not just the families that are directly faced with war. Most people do not even know what a Gold Star family is, and honestly, I did not know either until Stephen died. I've learned so much since that dark time in my life. We are not alone in this personal grief or our desire to honor the fallen. We acknowledge the sacrifice and the bravery of these men and women because we are all in awe of their great sacrifice, courage, and devotion to duty and each other. These men and women, our men and women, are fallen on the field of battle. Forevermore, that is their legacy. Their names are now enshrined on the scroll of America's hollow dead. And where they died, where they shed their blood, is sacred ground to us. As we look at the monument behind me, we see their faces, their families, we see their parents that are here today, their siblings, their spouses, and their children, all on this same journey. It is not about politics, the color of skin, what God you believe in. We are all in this together. We must do our part to honor the fallen and support our current military. My heart hurts for every single family that has gone through this. I look back at what I have learned about grief, family, patriotism, and sacrifice. I, have, I speak Stephen's name as much as I can and to whoever will listen. Stephen's son Harry passed away four years after Stephen died. My sister-in-law Wanda buried her husband and then four years later buried their son next to him. It was living the nightmare all over again. Same funeral home, same cemetery. I often wonder how one family can have so much tragedy in their life. But honestly, it has made me the person I am today. Stephen may not be here, but I carry him with me every day. I will speak his name and honor him until the day I die. <sighs> Saying farewell is never easy but honoring their name and contribution to the legacy of defending freedom will forever live on. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Michael Bailey. I have the pleasure of knowing Kendra Lynn very well. Thank you, Kendra. Thank you, especially heartfelt thanks uh, for Goldstar families that are here today. 
Where were you on September 11th? It was one of those days that will always live in infamy, just like we all know. December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor. November 22nd, 1963, the loss of President Kennedy. You know where you were. Our guest speaker knows precisely where he was on 9-11. While assigned to the Pentagon, American Airlines Flight 77 struck, struck the building and penetrated pretty much directly under Colonel Mark Volk's office. He's a very humble guy. He probably will not tell you this, but because of his heroism that day in evacuating and rescuing his military and civilian co-workers, he was awarded the Soldier's Medal. That is the Army's highest award for heroism when not in contact with the enemy. I find that definition a little difficult considering I believe those people were the enemy. He probably won't tell you that the uniform he wore that day is also charred, tattered, melted, and is part of an exhibit at the Smithsonian Institute. He'll probably tell you things like he's a good dog dad, he's a gentleman farmer, and he's a connoisseur of fine bourbon, America's whiskey. Yeah. I know where I was on 9-11 that morning. I was glued to the television like everyone else, and I was concerned and worried about the well-being of our guest speaker, my brother-in-law, Colonel Mark Volk, United States Army, retired. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my initial thought as I sit here, sat there listening to Kendra is, you don't need to hear from me. You, you've heard more uh, about what our Gold Star families have lived through, what many others have lived through, uh, then you need to hear from me. Um, so I'm kind of reluctant to stand up here and keep going, but, but, but because uh, I'm here, I, I guess I need to do that. Um, what I want to try and do is, is frame out a little bit of my context, what happened uh, in context of where I was, what I saw within the building that day, and then maybe kind of pulled it all together. Um, you know, why, why individuals, um, you know, much braver than me, uh, put their name on the line and sacrifice themselves. So hopefully I'll, I'll be able to do that uh, here with, within these next few minutes. I am both humbled and honored to be here with you this morning to commemorate the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attack on our country and to honor those who were lost that day, as well as those who have been lost in subsequent wars on terror, both in combat and those who succumbed after returning home. I began September 11th as I did every workday in the Pentagon, arriving at my office before 6 a.m. and settling into the routine activities. Our suite 3D450 was located on the D ring, the second outermost ring, third floor between the fourth and fifth quarters of the building. I had a TV in my office, and I turned around uh, from my desk to see the smoke billowing from the first World Trade uh, Center tower. I called my wife Lynn and told her about it, and as we spoke, I watched the second plane strike and knew that we were under attack. I hung up, walked out, of my boss, uh, out to my boss's office on the E-ring to ensure they were aware of what was going on, and then I returned where members of my staff were there watching the television to see what was going on in the world. Suddenly I felt the impact as the plane hit the building. It's a, to me it was a sensation similar to an approaching subway train as the station around you starts to vibrate as the train comes in. Almost immediately that was followed by a huge explosion that blew in the windows and orange flames pushed their way into our suite only to be pushed out by the overpressure system, which really prevented a lot of fires from starting. I knew that we'd been hit by a plane, but sensed that it had hit closer to the fifth corridor, not realizing until after I got home later that day that it actually passed directly underneath our office. I got to my feet and yelled in my most manly voice something that I remember to this day and embarrassed to say is, I yelled, everybody get out! <laughs> I mean, everybody get out. <laughs> and we began to evacuate the suite. 
There were holes in our floor, the windows on both sides of the suite were blown in, and there was some structural damage to the walls. My office was the furthest into the suite, so I started to methodically work my way towards the fourth quarter, ensuring that everyone was out, clearing each desk and cubicle as I went. The corridor looking out towards the E-ring was smoke-filled, and that continued to build as we stood there. I was there awaiting uh, people as they came through the smoke out of the E-ring towards the safety of the A-ring. A woman who worked on the E-ring came up to me and told me that she had been at a meeting and was unsure if her people had made it out. For whatever reason, I reached down, grabbed the fire extinguisher at my feet, and ran out, uh, ducking under the smoke, out to where her office was, kind of at the point of the uh, fourth quarter on the E-ring. Lee and a young Department of the Army contractor, Jeff Moore, followed me. We found her office totally burned out, still hot and reeking of jet fuel, but clear. From there, we began to systemi systematically clear earring offices on both sides of the fourth corridor, assisting and guiding uh, people as they went out. The floor was intact, but buckled, and the floors above us remained in place. I can't tell you how long we were out there. Perhaps because of the adrenaline, it almost felt like I was viewing things in slow motion. There was another person working with us. I've never figured out who that was. And we were attempting to kick in a door that was jammed shut. Suddenly there was another loud explosion, a secondary detonation, and the floor rippled like we were riding a wave. The ceiling tiles began to fall. I yelled for the four of us to evacuate in a much lower and controlled voice at that point. It was the first time that day that I sensed that I was actually in danger. Although Jeff Moore recounts that several times he watched as he watched, he expected to see me die. I waited as the others crawled out under the smoke down the corridor and then followed. I ultimately made my way to the center courtyard where triage was being conducted on some of the injured. Torn between wanting to continue to help and my responsibilities as a division chief, I finally opted to head out to our designated rally point in the parking lot to account for my staff. We eventually sent them home and it wasn't until later that I, and I saw the news co coverage that I realized the utter devastation of the World Trade Center, the full impact on the Pentagon and learned of the loss of Flight 93. Thousands killed and injured, families devastated, framed by countless stories of bravery, many much more compelling than mine. Jeff Moore and Lee Guggenwald, who followed me into the smoke, had no reason to do so, other than the desire to help others. Encourage beyond compare. As we now look upon this beautiful and touching memorial behind me to all of those who have fallen, it's only natural that we look for some meaning that helps us to deal with the pain of that loss. It'd certainly be easy to be distracted by current events in Afghanistan and here in the United States and focus on those things instead of what truly matters. In searching for some way to capture the why, the meaning of the tremendous sacrifice that leads even now to the new names being added to the Remembering the Fallen National Monument, I was drawn back to what gave me purpose of mind many years ago. In December of 1977, I recited this oath. I, Mark Volk, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I am about to enter, so help me God. The oath of enlistment for enlisted soldiers is very similar with the exception of the next to the last sentence, which states, and that I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me, according to the regulations of the, and the Uniform Code of Military Justice. These oaths in one form or another have been in place since our nation was born. And their call to commitment to the defense of our Constitution form the basis that gives meaning and purpose to whatever we are called upon to do. As members of the armed forces, we leave the politics for others to debate while we complete the missions we are given even at the risk of life and limb in fulfillment of those oaths. As soldiers, Marines, sailors, members of the Air Force, Coast Guard, and now even Space Force, we enter into a sacred contract that is both noble and compelling. For what could be a greater calling than to defend our Constitution and this great nation that has spawned from it? Never perfect, ever changing, a nation unlike any other. 
Yet the one single uniting factor that bonds all members in service to this country are the oaths we took to protect it. As we take the time to honor those who have fallen along the way, to recognize and honor those who, uh, uh, who not just their sacrifice, but the sacrifice of their families, as well as the many more who have suffered wounds, both physical and mental. Members of our armed forces, first responders, police, fire, EMTs, and even the many civilian contractors who fell since 9-11-2001. Let us recommit to finding our way back to the spirit of post 9-11 when we all work together, not just to protect our nation, but to strengthen and reinvigorate it as the beacon of light among the world where freedom does ring and we never forget our fallen. Never. Thank you. Welcome, and thank you for coming so that we can together honor the fallen. Today is a day of remembrance. We all must remember the 2,997 who perished 20 years ago today when 19 savage, radical, jihadists attacked our country. We must remember the 7,051 who have given their lives to support and protect our country. We must remember them as President Lincoln said, those who gave the last full measure of devotion. And because it's a day of remembrance, we must speak of, tell of, and teach of what happened at the Twin Towers, at the Pentagon, and at Shrinkville. And in the words of another president, everybody seems to be familiar with the last full measure, but in the words of another president who talks about remembrance, Ronald Reagan said at our International Cemetery in 1983, something that has stayed with me for a long time, and I'm going to read this because I don't want to get it wrong. It is, in a way, 
an odd thing to honor those who died in defense of our country in wars far away. Our memory plays tricks. We see these soldiers in our mind as grave and gray, as wise and old. But they were boys, just boys when they died. When they died, they gave up two lives. The lives they were living that day and the lives that they would have lived. They gave up their chance to be husbands, fathers, grandparents, to live to old age and be revered as wise men. They gave up everything for our country, for us. And all we can do is remember. And as we remember the 2,997 who died 20 years ago, we must remember the 7,051 and the more than 5,000 that are behind me today. We must remember that, as Kendra so eloquently discussed, they all had families and friends and histories. I can't imagine, I can't even deal with all of the stories that go with those photographs. But I can deal with one. First Lieutenant Michael Cleary. Our Michaeline. Mike came into this world on April 4th, 1981. Four weeks early, he had to spend a couple of extra weeks in the hospital for his lungs to mature. Born in Wilkes-Barre, he grew up in Dallas. Mike did what all kids did. He played back mountain youth soccer. He loved to fish. He learned to fish. He, he played Little League. He made the all-star team that won the district. He went on to Dallas High School where uh, where he was in the Honor Society and President of the Student Council and Captain of the Tennis Team and Captain of the Soccer Team and made the All-Star Teams. When he graduated, he went to college in upstate New York. He made the soccer team, he lettered in tennis, became president of his fraternity, was in the honors program in economics. And then 9-11, as he began his junior year. We called, he talked about it, and when he came home for Thanksgiving, he had his papers for Q qualifications for enlistment in special forces. Our hearts broke between his mom's tears, the three of our talks. He finally said, he looked at me and said, Dad, you did this. And I said, I understand your sentiment. I don't like your timing. So he promised he would finish, which he did. But in the meantime, he signed up. Hamilton had no ROTC, so he signed up at Syracuse University in the Air Force program, found that wanting, uh, was contacted by a Marine recruiter, was brought into the uh, PLC, the platoon leader class, as an aviator, graduated in 2003, and of course that was when we went to Iraq. The Marines canceled their uh, 
they kept their p two PLCs for their infantry types, but they uh, postponed the aviation until January. Mike came to us and said, I can't wait. He enlisted, he graduated in May, he enlisted on June 3rd of 2003. Went to basic training at, at Fort Jackson, uh, made sergeant, went to officer candidate school at Fort Benning, went to combat engineer officer basic at Fort Leonard Wood, graduated only seven of uh, the 49 that started in his sapper class, went to Fort Benning, jump school, British SAS terror school, and became first platoon leader of Echo Company, 1st of the 15th, 3rd Brigade, 3rd Infantry Division. Because of his sapper training, 1st Platoon was the EOD, the Explosive Ordnance Disposal Platoon. January 4th, 2005, Mike deployed to Iraq. served faithfully, valiantly. His platoon, according to uh, Colonel, now General Brito, said destroyed in excess of 160 IEDs. December 20th, 2005, he had signed his platoon over. He was two weeks from coming home a month away from getting married to his high school sweetheart. They got actual actionable intelligence. He took his platoon, they assaulted an Al-Qaeda bomb factory and destroyed it, and the way back was ambushed and killed. December 20th, 2005 changed our lives forever. Mary Ann and Patrick, and Mike's three sisters, Aaron, Shannon, and Kelly. We, we could never get past, we could never get over. But what we did was we, we stood up face front and continued to march. We started a foundation for Mike in his honor to, and we've helped individual veterans, we've helped fund the Northeast PA Vets Multi-Care Center, the Hunts for Healing, Patriots Cove, all of which do wonderful things for those who have served. The facts I gave you about Michael could probably be found in his biography, or maybe even an obituary, but there are three things that I'd like to mention before I close. First of all, his brother Patrick, who they were inseparable. Uh, Pat's three years older than Mike and has Down syndrome, and they just went through life together. When Pat was 13 and he kind of wanted to learn to drive, we got him a go-kart. Marianne and I were away for the day, came back, go-kart was all smashed up. Michael stepped up and he said, it was my fault. And we read him the riot act. We did not find out that Pat crashed the go-kart and Mike took the rap. Number two, his sister Shannon, who uh, was living in Japan at the time, had come home and I, at that time maybe once a year and we were all, as a family, we spent holidays together. Mike never missed a holiday, even when he was in, he, I don't know how he did it while he was at OCS, but he got back. So Shannon was ready to fly back to Japan. Mike was, we waited and waited, Mike wasn't there. He was, he was fishing on the Susquehanna with some of his high school friends. And daughter Shannon looked at Marianne and I and said, Mike isn't always where he's supposed to be but he's always where he wants to be. 
And lastly, to flesh out the person that Mike was, when he was about 16, driving, I think he went to his first prom. When he came home that night, and it was late, he came into our bedroom and he gave his mother a kiss. Every night thereafter, when he was out, he gave his mom a kiss goodnight. So let us remember the 2,997 that died this day. Let us remember the 7,051 who have died defending our rights. Let us try to remember the spirit that we felt as a nation when George Bush stood on that rubble and said, you're either with us or you're with the terrorist, and how united we felt. Because as Ronald Reagan said, all we can do is remember, lest we forget. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. My name is Bill Evans. <clears throat> I live up in the northern part of the state. And I remember exactly what I was doing 20 years ago. I was working on the outside of a building on a scaffold, several stories up. And the man that was in charge of the building came running in and he said, you guys got to come down, you got to come down. So we didn't understand why. And he told us to come down and we run inside, turn the TVs on. And that was just when the second plane hit the tower. <coughs> At first, people weren't sure what was, what was happening. And then all of a sudden, you know, we all realized that it was terror. The thing that sticks out the most, has been mentioned a couple times this morning, is the people that were lost on that day, the people that were lost recently, uh, the people that were lost in between there and now, but all the families that are involved, and there are several of them here today, um, how, how everybody's life has changed in 20 years. Uh, the firemen, the police, the people that worked in the Pentagon. Everybody has a story and all of our lives have changed. We probably all know someone who lost somebody or know somebody who lost somebody. Some of us here today all, and all over the country, families of the fallen will grieve the rest of their lives. My heart goes out to the soldiers, Marines, the Air Force, Navy, Coast Guard, and all, the, and all the EMTs, firemen, all the first responders, what they, what the damage they suffer each day. The people that were with some of our fallen soldiers suffer every day of what they had to see of our, our, our family members, but they were friends and we back here were allowed to grieve and we still grieve every day. They, they weren't given much of a time to grieve right back out into the war. There's suicides, 22 suicides a day. That we gotta, we gotta get a handle on that the best way we know how. If anybody needs help, reach out. On September 13, which is coming up here in a couple days, it would be my son's. It's his birthday, but on he was a photographer. He was in the National Guard. His goal was to keep his job, go to college, and serve his country. Shortly after he joined, he was told that he would not have to be deployed because the unit had just come back from another deployment. But they all got the word that they were, they were going to get deployed to Iraq. <coughs> In June of 2005, they, they, that's when they finished their training in uh, Mississippi. Uh, my family was one of the fortunate ones that went down to see the ceremony to send them off. Uh, 
they got to spend a few days off the post and then all of a sudden word was given that not they can't leave no more my son came from a military family I was in the military and uh, at the very end of the Vietnam War I never served in in combat but I was a, belonged to a combat support group in Southeast Asia my dad was a World War II vet and my oldest brother served twice in Vietnam I also had an uncle that was in the military. So military was not new to my son. And when he came to me with the information that the recruiter had been pestering him at high school, he said, can he come to our house and talk to us? I said, yes, as long as I'm there with you. I want to hear what he says. He was happy to think of the idea that he could follow the family tradition of the military but he was a little bit leery of it because he didn't he wasn't sure how he was going to jockey going to college and keeping his job and in them days they were called weekend warriors which we all know that there's no such thing as that anymore when he got when he finally got deployed we saw him off from Mississippi he left we flew back home he contacted us on the computer in them days it was called um, instant message anytime he was able to be near a computer he contacted us he said he, he was scared to death and he said the first day out first mission they were out on they got shot at and they would be gone sometimes they would be out a couple days on September 19th six days after he turned 22 is when his vehicle had unloaded the soldiers out of the back he drived a, a Bradley armored vehicle and they were they had moved to a parking spot and that's when an IED went off underneath him and he he had closed the hatch over his head but he never had it locked and when the blast went off that latch opened up and let the majority of the blast out through that hatch and knocked the two guys up on the up on top of the vehicle knocked them off one of which was never able to return to to a regular combat duty the other was uh, had a um, he was just not hurt very bad but they again they weren't allowed to grieve They're, they lost their friend and he was shipped my son was sent to uh, Baghdad in a helicopter and he died on the way there the information we got was that he was killed as a result of combat. All of our lives were changed forever and will never be the same along with thousands of other families. Every birthday, holiday, dreams we all have of what they would be like today was gone and will always be gone. But we go through life, no time will tell. And it's always people say that time heals it. The best way that it was ever presented to me was a group that I belonged to years ago. It said, uh, they ask about time healing grief. And the lady said, no, it never goes away. She said, time, the longer it goes, the less pain there is. She said, the pain actually softens, but it never goes away. Behind me is over 5,000 pictures of and stories of different people on these towers. And that's not, that doesn't include everyone that was lost, only the ones that sent stuff in. Again, my son's birthday will be in a couple days. His date of his death was the 19th of September. And nine days later, five more of his friends from his little National Guard unit out of New Milford, Pennsylvania were all killed in the same day. His unit sent had, had 60 members and they, they sent 60 to be deployed and six of them were killed. So let's look around wherever we go, honor their sacrifice and be thankful that they took the oath that they did and thankful to all the veterans and first responders and police all take an oath that never ends. 
and a special thanks to Kendra and all the people that organized this event. What, a, what an honor it is to be here on such a 20, 20th anniversary of a day that none of us will ever forget. Love your loved ones every day. Tell them you love them because so you never know when the last time you'll see them could come. Thank, again, thanks to all the uh, people, the motorcycles, the vehicles that helped escort this over here and some that rode in today as part of this. And I just, let's all be united again like we were the day after this tragic accident happened. God bless you and God bless America. Good morning. My name is Sean Sweeney. I'm a Chief Warrant Officer with the United States Navy. I joined the world's greatest Navy after the, tra uh, the tragic events uh, on September 11, 2001. My wife, Michelle, and I were married on September 28, 1996. I planned our fifth wedding anniversary in September of 2001. I had reservations made for Windows on the World which is a restaurant in the North Tower and the World Trade Centers. After the tragic events of what happened that day, I had explained to Michelle what had happened. I said, honey, I had a nice, uh, you know, fifth wedding anniversary planned, and then as a result of what happened, it wasn't gonna happen anymore. We were hurt, we were sad, I was angry. In the weeks and months to follow, I told Michelle my anger grew. I said I had to do something. I wanted to make a difference out there. So, what do I do? I talked to all the different branches of service, all the recruiters, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard. And in May of 2002, I raised my hand and enlisted into the United States Navy. I would just like to say that it's an all volunteer service. 5,000 folks here, all raised their hands, all for different reasons. All to defend freedom and democracy around the world. So, with all that being said, I would like to point out, Kendra, your brother sacrificed, your family, all the Gold Star families that are here today. You know, thank you for all that you do. Kendra gives tirelessly to the veterans organizations all over the place. She's always supporting, she's always setting up events. You know, she brought the wall here today, the pillars, on the 20th anniversary to Scranton, Pennsylvania. Thank you. To all of you that are here today, supporting all of us and all of them, I thank you. And may God bless America. Thank you all. God bless America. Land that I love, stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above, from the mountains to the prairies, the oceans white with foam. God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, my home, sweet Amazing to see everyone out here today and to hear all of the stories of loss and sacrifice. Um, as I prepared for this in the last couple weeks, it didn't even dawn on me that my high school friend Damien Fisick is, is on one of these pillars behind me. Um, it's interesting how we grieve. It's interesting how we prepare for days like this. We've all known this is coming. Kendra. Dave, uh, Chris from my office, we all, we all sat a month ago to plan this, and Chief Judge, Chief, Chief Nemeka, other city officials figured out how we could help. But it's interesting that these moments don't hit you until 
you don't even know it's going to come. You know, grief, grief is a journey, Mr. Evans, as you said. Pain softens, but it never goes away, and we never know when things are going to hit us. It's amazing to have these pillars here. Kendra, for, thank you for bringing the Remembering Our Fallen Monument again here to Scranton. The grief that we feel for 9-11, the grief that we feel for those we have lost. Damien Fisick, my high school friend, died early on. He was killed in action in 2003, maybe 2004. And then we have these chairs to our right, those who were killed just two weeks ago. It's a journey that we're all on together. It's a journey of grief. It's a journey of sacrifice. It's a journey of gratitude. Today we are grateful as we remember. It's also a day of service in my mind, and I thank everyone for their service in the military, for their service as our, our public safety officers, as our police, our fire, our EMS. But for those of us who are mere civilians, the service that we give, we need to be thoughtful about how we can give back. Those who have come here today to talk about their lost loved ones who have died in action, they're serving in some way. For people like me who have, a f have friends that, that died, um, family members who, uh, who served in prior wars like Vietnam, it's a, it's a constant act, I think, to determine how you can serve your country in different ways. So I ask that today all of us who serve in different ways Think about how we can continue to serve our community. How can we serve these veteran organizations? How can we make sure the veterans that are coming home have the services they need? The veteran suicide rate is, is a, it's just horribly, horribly sad and we can do everything, we will do everything we can to help with that. But there's different ways that we can help our community every single day. Today is a special day as we remember specifically and it's an honor to be able to speak here today with these names and photos and this remembrance behind me. Kendra, thank you for this and thank you all for your stories for your service for that of your loved ones and may we all go through these days and through these years always remembering always coming back for September 11th but remembering every day and giving each other the latitude that grief strikes at different points and we should always be there for each other whenever those moments strike thank you Good morning, everyone. My name is Dave Isley. I'm the director of Lackawanna County Veterans Affairs and a Marine Corps veteran. Kendra, thank you for inviting me out to say a few words. Uh, I never really prepare. <laughs> Just kind of shoot from the hip and speak from the heart. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to have an awesome, awesome team at Lackawanna County. Last year was a crazy, crazy year for us. And uh, our county commissioners thought ahead and moved our Veterans Affairs Office to the first floor right in front of the building because we are a, a veteran community. We strive every day to continue to serve them for serving us. And uh, I'm just thankful for being here today. And I'd like everybody to give a round of applause that our, here, our everyday heroes are standing right over here. They put these blue stars in for this monument, and Patriots Day is about them too. So let's not forget our guys that are ripping doors off cars, pulling you out, getting you to the hospital in time, and saving your home. So thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Guys, my name is Teddy Daniels, and I was wounded in Afghanistan in 2012. But when 9-11 happened, I was a police officer working outside of Baltimore, Maryland. I had just finished an overnight shift, got off work at 7 a.m., went home, got cleaned up, and was looking to get some rest. And we didn't all have cell phones back then, like everybody does today. We had the department issued pagers, and the pagers started going off. Apparently, I missed a few pages, and then the phone started to ring. And it was my deputy chief saying, gear up, get back in, all hands on deck. And I said, sir, what's happening? He goes, I'll explain to you when you get in. I didn't know if I was in trouble or, or what. You know, deputy chief calls your house, tells you to get in and work. So I rolled in, the entire department got called back in. And you gotta remember on 9-11, those planes had hit. At the time, we thought that was just the first wave. 
We didn't know what was going to happen next. We didn't know if it was going to be suicide bombers, vehicle bombs. So we spent the rest of that morning clearing court buildings, shopping malls, and schools. And it wasn't until later that night when I actually got to sit in front of the TV and take in what was going on, I felt anger. I was mad. But you know, on 9-12, on this country came together, and it was incredible. There was no black, white, Hispanic, Jew or Gentile. We were all Americans. And we need to have that feeling again. You know, people say, 9-11, let's not forget. I think a lot of people have. So through the years, I still had that bug in me. And in 2011, I went active duty military, joined the Army Infantry. 2012, I was in Afghanistan right where I wanted to be. You know, with all these, these faces and names on, the, on these banners behind me, I want to talk about heroes. I served with heroes. Some of them are on these banners. There's heroes here today. I think that's a term that over the last couple of years has been thrown around very loose. Is heroes. Everybody's a hero. It's not the case. As men and women were running out of those towers, there were cops and firefighters running in. That's a hero. On Flight 93, there's 40 passengers. And Todd Beamer issued those words, let's roll. They knew their fate. They knew where that plane was going to hit, and they were heroes. They stood up and did something. And the names and faces behind me, those men and women answered the call. Those are heroes. I think we need to take time, not just today, but every day, and be thankful for our police officers, for our first responders, for our firefighters, and for our soldiers who have paid the ultimate sacrifice. You know, I, I obviously served 20 years in uniform combined with law enforcement and military, and you know, people say, Teddy, thanks, you're a hero. No, I'm not. The heroes are the guys that didn't come home. Those are the heroes. I get another tomorrow because they gave up theirs. Take time, reflect. And I think about on 9-11, and again, I, I spoke to a Boy Scout troop a couple nights ago about 9-11 because a lot of schools don't even teach what, what happened that day. And I said, you know, for me, it was over 2,977 people who kissed their families goodbye that morning and went and got on a plane or went to work, never to be seen again. But we got through it as a nation. We got stronger as a nation. And it showed the rest of the world the American resolve, the grit, and the pride that comes with being an American. For all the veterans here, for the firefighters, the police officers, the first responders, God bless all of you. Because I couldn't imagine a world without you. Thank you.
In closing today, I just want to thank everybody for coming out, honoring our heroes. The memorial will be up until Wednesday morning. We are still looking for volunteers to rename of all 7,051 men and women that were killed since September 11, 2001 later today or even tomorrow because it takes about 10 hours. There's some special people um, that I want to thank. All the people um, that sponsored this, Blue Star Moms, thank you so much. I don't know where they are, but they're an amazing group of moms that all have current um, sons or daughters in the military. So thank you to them. I pray that your star forever remains blue. Eagle Cleaners, Kathy and Buddy Croft, talk about being proud parents of a Marine. <laughs> Their son is going for his first sergeant, Michael. He currently serves, and these two people, mom and dad, they could not be more proud of him. Thank you for always supporting us. Sergeant Jan Argonish ride, which is actually tomorrow, beginning in Jessup. Um, ride leaves at 12, I believe. Sign up is 9 to 11. 8 to 11, Talia? Yeah, okay. Um, wonderful event. They, they sponsored this memorial wall too. They're wonderful, wonderful. Michael, Jan's dad, and Talia, thank you for always supporting me too. Lieutenant Michael Cleary Fund. I read so much about Michael and I, every day, um, I always think about him. I think of all of our locals and I'm just so thankful for you guys. I wish I had the chance to meet him. My people in charge of the motorcycle escort, Dwayne McDavid, Marshall Lenz, and Dave Reagan. Y'all are rock stars. You guys did great. Um, a little prayer for one of the riders, Laura. She, what a true patriot. She, every day, she posts on Facebook in memory of the Pennsylvania's fallen, whoever passed away that day. She posts every morning. On her way back from escorting the monument, monument she was in an accident. Um, a deer hit her, broke her leg. She messaged me this morning from the hospital bed. She's been in the hospital since Thursday. Surgery yesterday, and we'll have to have another surgery in three weeks. So say a little prayer for her. Dave, Dave Lewin, who brings the monument, he travels around with it. Where is he? There he is. Thanks, Dave. You're, he's a former Marine. He travels. <laughs> <laughs> okay, he's he's a marine. His buddy Gunny, who I he brought here, I absolutely love that man. They, if you have a chance, stop by and talk to them. You could literally listen to them all day long. They they are they are great. Thank you for what you do, Dave. Um, Scranton Fire Company. Thank you guys so much. Like everyone has said, you are our heroes. You're our everyday heroes. That I mean, I don't think we drive any day that we don't see a fire truck or an ambulance out hard at work saving lives and taking care of us. So thank you for all that you do. My boss, Michael Bailey, even though he says I'm the boss, which where is he? There he is. He, he literally is my saving grace. When I'm sad at work or just anything like this that comes up, he's He's a hugger, and he's a long hugger, so. <laughs> um, but he's always there for me, so thank you. Thank you, thank you. He's one of the most patriotic men I know. My family, my husband, who's somewhere, my daughter, um, my best friend Carolyn that's out there, thank you for coming and supporting me. Thank you to all the Gold Star families for sharing your son or daughter with us and their story. Whew. Upon conclusion of the plane of taps, we are gonna begin to read the names of 7,051 men and women who gave the ultimate sacrifice during that day. Please feel free once the service ends to tour the towers while you're hearing those names as you're walking through them. See that face and know that they're ordinary people just like us. There's roses. Feel free to take one, put them down by your loved one. 
Stephen is not here, but I accept it, and him dying for our country is one less other family having to go through this pain. Thank you all for coming. God bless you, and God bless America. The benediction will now be read by Dennis D'Augustine from the Scranton Fire Department. Kendra, we'll, we'll pray for Laura. And um, me and my boys were walking through here and just want to highlight one other lost life. Uh, I met the, the Arnold family, and uh, I just want to tell you guys, Daniel Arnold, Arnold killed 2005 never forgotten. God bless you guys. Let's pray. God, I just pray for these families. I pray for our community. Lord, I pray for renewed presence and strength and courage and resolve. Thank you for our veterans, each and every one of them. Thank you for our first responders. God, the past years have been inscribed in our memories. We look back in horror on the terrorist attacks on September 11th. But today we look with honor on acts of courage by ordinary people who sacrificed themselves to prevent further death and destruction. We shed our tears in a common bond of grief for those we loved and those we lost. We journeyed through a dark valley, but your light has led us to a place of hope. You've turned our grief into determination we are resolved to do what is good and right and just. Help us to remember what it means to be Americans, a people endowed with abundant blessings. Help us to cherish the freedoms we enjoy and inspire us to stand with courage, united as one nation in the midst of any adversity. Lord, hear this prayer for our nation. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And grace my fears relieved How precious did that grace appear The
Thank you. One more little thing I want to say um, before before this ends is over to the right of me, those are two twin towers that were put here by the County of Lackawanna um, a couple years ago. Please make sure you take a stroll around. On the back side of those are the Lackawanna County natives that um, were killed on September 11, 2001, and also um, the local from Lackawanna County that were killed in Iraq or Afghanistan. Yesterday, we walked over and we saw a quarter on top of those twin towers. For those of you that don't know what that means, I did not know what that means until Memorial Day of this year when me and my husband went up to Stephen's grave up in um, Watertown, New York, and there was a quarter on top of his headstone, which has never been there before. I've read the penny, the nickel, and the dime. I've seen those before. So I immediately pulled out my phone and Googled quarter on top of a gravestone. I've never had the breath taken away from me like I did at that moment. That quarter means that that person that placed it there was with that person when they were killed. So at some point yesterday, someone came here that was with one of our local heroes and placed that quarter on top of that monument. So please, it's not for a payphone if there's any out there. <laughs> um, it's purposely left there. So if you get a moment, it's, it really is a breathtaking um, thing to look at. So again, thank you everyone for coming. Please feel free to view the towers now and we'll begin reading names shortly. Thank you. Okay.